evening. My name is Uta Poiger and I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern University. It is my honor to welcome all of you to the 22nd annual Robert Solomon Morton Memorial Lecture, which is the keynote event of Northeastern's Holocaust Awareness Week. Before we start our discussion with our distinguished panel tonight on masterpieces and moral justice, who is heir to plundered art, I would like to do some thank yous. First of all, I would like to thank Laura Leff and the Holocaust Awareness Committee, which she chairs, uh, a committee that is comprised of Northeastern faculty, staff, and students from a range of colleges. And it is the committee that is bringing us the outstanding program tonight, and in general, a week of outstanding programs for Holocaust awareness. So thank you very much to the Holocaust Awareness Committee and to its um, chair, Laura Leff. Um, Laurie Lefkowitz, um, the director of the Humanities Center, which is a co-sponsor of Holocaust Awareness Week, and um, the staff associated with the Dean's Office and the um, Humanities Center, including Erica Koss, who is Assistant Dean in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, Megan Brisson, and others who are helping us in um, putting together this important um, series of events. And then I very much hope that you will join me in thanking the Morton and Giesen families for generously supporting our efforts of bringing leading intellectuals to Boston and to Northeastern to reflect on the legacies of the Holocaust with the Robert Solomon Memorial Lecture. Let me give you a bit of background on the lectureship. We have to thank a chance encounter in a barbershop, I think it was probably in Cambridge, the barbershop, yes it was, we in fact have Robert Solomon Morton's son here, and I, I, I thank them more in just a minute. Um, it was a, thank, a chance encounter in a barbershop in Cambridge that we can thank for the Robert Solomon Morton Memorial Lecture. Robert Morton was born in Frankfurt am Main in Germany in 1906. He was educated in the school of the Orthodox Synagogue, Kahal Adaf Yeshuron. And he, after a particularly harrowing experience in 1934, so relatively soon after the Nazis came to power, he was convinced that he had no choice but to apply for immigration to the United States and then left with his family in 1937 and settled here in Boston. For many years, he and his wife Sophie were caretakers of the Hillel Foundation at Harvard University. And it was during this time at Hillel that a chance meeting at that barbershop brought Robert Morton together with Bill Giesen. Bill Giesen was then a postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was quite a bit younger than Morton, born in 1932, and in fact, I just realized this, uh, this evening that Tony Morton, that you were born the same year as Bill Giesen, and that that is also one of the connections between your family and the Giesens. Um, Bill Giesen went on to teach chemistry and mechanical engineering at Northeastern for almost 40 years. He grew up in Frankfurt as well and was educated there during the Nazi years and their immediate aftermath. The encounter in the barbershop resulted in a long-time friendship and ongoing conversation between Robert Solomon Morton and Bill Giesen. And Bill Giesen eventually then created the Robert Solomon Memorial Lecture as a way of memorializing a person who, for him and for us, embodied the spirit of understanding and reconciliation. At this point, there is yet another chapter in, this, in the history of this lectureship. The lectureship is supported by the Gustav Korman Giesen Memorial Fund, and it is also now supported by a new fund created just last year by Robert Solomon Morton's grandsons, Mike and Evan Morton. And it's a great honor indeed to have so many members of the Morton family here tonight. Thank you so much, Mike. Tony, and all of you for being here and for supporting this wonderful intellectual experience. <laughs> and we might even be so lucky to soon welcome Marie Giesen, who is the wife of Bill Giesen, who is apparently on her way and is uh, hopefully going to arrive in the course of the evening as well, which would be um, a wonderful um, uh, event as well. So again, 
Many thanks for being here tonight, for supporting intellectual exchange on important moral questions related to the Holocaust here at Northeastern. And it is then my great pleasure to introduce to you our moderator tonight, whom I've already mentioned, the chair of our Holocaust Awareness Committee, Laurel Leff. Professor Leff chairs, uh, is uh, also an associate director of our um, Jewish Studies program here at Northeastern. And I should have probably mentioned earlier that the director of our Humanities Center actually is also the director of the Jewish Studies program as well as a professor of English. So um, she holds, in fact, many hats. So I'm very grateful for the work that the Jewish Studies program is doing here at Northeastern. Laura Left teaches in the School of Journalism. Her own research and publications focus on American responses to the Holocaust, and she is also the Stotsky Professor of Jewish Historical and Cultural Studies in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. Thank you, Laurel, for moderating tonight's event. Can everybody hear me? Is the mic working okay? I just have to double check that. Okay, great. Um, when we decided to look at the timely important topic of who is heir to plundered art, uh, I came up with a wish list of whom I would like to serve on a panel. Um, and here it is, my wish list. Uh, these really are the most knowledgeable, thoughtful, and committed people on this complicated and difficult subject. I'm going to introduce them briefly. Um, for a fuller, but by no means complete, biography, um, please take a look at the program because I think you will then see just how accomplished they are. Um, Douglas Davidson, who is uh, over, right over there, is the Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues responsible for developing and implementing U.S. policy pertaining to the return of Holocaust-era assets to their rightful owners, compensation for wrongs committed during the Holocaust, and Holocaust remembrance. Uh, he has held the position since 2010. Before that, he was a diplomat serving in several critical and tough posts, such as Kosovo, Zagreb, Belgrade, and Peshawar, and in perhaps the assignment that drew the most fire as Assistant Press Secretary in the White House. I just had to say that as a journalist. Um, Wesley Fisher, it, at the end there, is the Director of Research for the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. He is responsible for the Claims Conference World Jewish Restitution, it's got a long name, um, Organization Looted Art and Cultural Property Initiative, and has produced the worldwide descriptive catalog of looted Judaica, helped to make the records of the largest Nazi agency confiscating Jewish cultural property accessible and searchable, and has held discussions and negotiations with relevant governmental and non-governmental agencies. Um, Wellesley was a senior member of the founding staff of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and was deputy director of the 1998 Washington Conference on Holocaust Era Assets. My, Mark Mazeroski has researched the question of assets looted during the Holocaust and World War II since 1980. He is the director of the Provenance Research Training Program of the European Shoah Legacy Institute and he oversees a database of looted art in German-occupied France, a joint project through the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Claims Conference. Um, from being Facebook friends with the Restitution Project, I can tell you Mark is a relentless advocate. Um, Victoria Reed, you're all laughing. Uh, Victoria Reed is the curator for provenance um, at the Museum of Fine Arts where she is responsible for the research and documentation of the provenance of the MFA's collection, the review of potential acquisitions and loans, and the development of due diligence policies and practice throughout the curatorial division. So, those are our panelists, and here's how we'll proceed. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, I'll then lead a discussion among the panelists and we'll then open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, there'll be a mic, it's not there now, but it will be when we open it up for questions. And audience members are asked to come and uh, speak into them, ask their questions from the mic. Um, to start, I've asked the panelists to address particular questions. Um, I've asked Douglas to address what he sees as the critical issues to be resolved on the art restitution issue in the coming year and what the role of the State Department is in those initiatives. 
Um, Wellesley, Wesley, excuse me, will test the issue up as well, but from the perspective of the world Jewish community as represented by the Claims Conference. I then asked Mark and Victoria to take a different tone um, by selecting one example of a contested Holocaust era artwork and using it to illustrate what this work has symbolized in each of its contexts, what it had mean to its creator, to its Jewish owners, to the Nazis, to whoever has had it since 1945, and what does it mean now that its ownership is being contested. So that's what we'll take up in, in terms of introductions, and then we will have a lively discussion, I'm sure. So we'll start with that. Thank you very much, Laurel, and uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Can you all hear me? As I'm told I to speak softly so people can't often hear in the back. Is this all right? As you could probably hear from the brief biography she gave, I'm kind of a ringer here. I'm new to the field compared to my esteemed colleagues, and I guess the best I can do this evening is represent the government bureaucrat's perspective for what it's worth. I also apologize because I understand there are at least two PowerPoint presentations to come. Some years ago, I was in a training course for senior officers at the State Department where a bunch of middle-aged men and women attempted to learn PowerPoint. Unfortunately, one of our colleagues got as far as the sound effects where you could blow things up, and we spent two hours learning to make explosions in a sort of late burst of childhood, never beyond there. So you just have to listen to me talk a bit. Um, to begin with, I think as we talk about the challenges of the year to come, the State Department's role, it's hard to examine those without taking into account two things. One is, I think, the phenomenon of a movie that's come out called The Monuments Men, which I presume many of you are familiar with. And the second is a discovery last November of a large cache of artworks in the apartment of an eccentric, then 80-year-old German man named Cornelius Gerlitt that, um, for those in the world that my colleagues and I are in, it was a bit of a surprise, and it was a bit of a, a shock. It also turned out to be badly overreported or a bad, inaccurately reported, but I'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I want to start off with a, by reading you a review of a movie, The Monuments Men, that appeared in New Yorker a, a few weeks back, and I'll get to the reason why I'm doing this. But I have to start with something that's even more extraneous, because it starts with a movie that Mark extolled on his website one day, so I can't resist not beginning with that. Here's how the review begins. A half century ago, Burt Lancaster, playing an unusually broad-shouldered French railroad worker, saved art treasures stored at the Jeux de Pomme from Paul Schofield. As a Wehrmacht colonel with precise speech, a, fixed, a foul temper, and a fondness for Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso. The train, directed by John Frankenheimer, was set in the summer of 1944. The colonel was trying to take the works to Germany before the Allies liberated France. Frankenheimer, working in handsome black and white, did extraordinary things with rail ties, heavy bolts, and puffing steam locomotives, and the two actors competed in physical determination. Lancaster, a former acrobat, scabbered over walls and rolled down hills and finally shot Schofield, who stood stock still by the side of the tracks. As an action film, the train remains first rate. As a moral conundrum, is great art worth the loss of human life? It also holds up. The author of this review then goes on to contrast this with the, uh, the Monuments Man. If I can find the rest, I will get to the back part. And in effect, he says that, um, uh, let me read the back part, and then I'll, I'm talking about George Clooney's anatomy. <coughs> but then, suddenly, Clooney will throw in a young soldier dying in a welter of blood. With such inst in steady direction, it's not surprising that performers uh, can't work up much rhythm. What would Burt Lancaster have made of such irresolute stuff? Everything he was doing. He did was intensive, forceful, definitive. We may have gained something in humor by not taking the saviors in art more, story more seriously, but we've lost about all of the romantic pleasure of heroism. 
And I think that's one of the differences. As you get over time, and as the, the uh, review makes a point elsewhere, and, and here I've just, excuse me, found the part I wanted to find. The movie in Pet might have worked on a smaller scale if it had focused more on intellectual obsessiveness, on the zeal of connoisseurs who finally get to hold in their hands the works they have studied for a lifetime. Unfortunately, Clooney has higher things in mind. He delivers several big speeches about the Nazis trying to hijack the common part of Western civilization. The talk is grand, but then you realize that most of the works will be returned to private collections. People should be given back what was taken from them, but those paintings weren't part of a publicly shared heritage. What's, what sort of sets the, lets the air out of the bag for the rest of us? When the monuments men stand in front of the art they love, they are awestruck, but the passion isn't there. It's really, I think, important because what we're dealing with now more and more, I think, is art that may be in private hands. And it's something that we really haven't focused on too much in my work in the State Department, which has looked at mainly at taking things that didn't belong in museums and trying to get, back, get them back to people in museums, in private hands, excuse me. But now with Cornelius Gerlich, you had a man who was the son of a Nazi dealer was allowed to deal in degenerate art, obviously retained a lot of artworks. The initial reports of 1,400 paintings being worth a billion and a half dollars were quite incorrect. But there are some valuable paintings, plus 60 more that seem to have appeared in his house in Salzburg. And the conundrum becomes, here's a private citizen who owns these things. He's being investigated basically for tax evasion. And all sorts of things have followed from the the investigation for tax evasion. If the tax evasion investigation ends, a lot of the research into the rightful ownership of the paintings will be simply come to end, the painting will revert to him. The question arises, what should we as a U.S. government or my colleagues do for this? It's, I think that this is the biggest challenge we're going to face in the next year because at the same time, if you believe people like panelists and perhaps the author of the book the Monuments Men. More and more you'll see works of art that may actually have been taken by members of the greatest generation brought to this country and uh, then suddenly as they pass away sadly come onto market and you wonder who owned these works of art when they were brought back as war booty and where did they go? I don't think we have a good answer for this. I bring this up because it's something we're wrestling with. The Washington the State Department's involvement, which really goes back to the end of the Second World War and was active in the 50s. And I could talk about a woman named Ardelia Hall, who um, was the Assistant Secretary of State for Cultural Affairs in the 50s. But I also have to leave that to Mark and Tory because they know a lot more about her than I do. But after a period that, of fairly intense activity, all of this lay dormant until the 90s, and I think it's a common phenomenon with Holocaust restitution issues in general. They came to the fore in the 1990s, partly due to class action lawsuits, partly due to scholarship, like Professor Grimstead, who's here someplace, and others bringing um, this issue back into the public spotlight. In 1998, there was a big conference in Washington on the return of Holocaust-era assets. And it produced something called the Washington Conference Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. The first guy to have my job actually edited the proceedings of this conference. And although we often talk uh, about the Washington Conference Principles, if you look at this book, which is a thousand and some pages thick, full of speeches and all sorts of things, you have to go to page something like 997 to find the Washington Conference Principles, of which they are actually 11 sentences long, and they uh, set out principles for returning art and for finding just and fair solutions. They have been expanded upon at several conferences since, and most notably in Vilnius and um, then again in Prague in 2009 in something called the Terrorism Declaration. So when this German case broke, a lot of people said Germany has an obligation to uphold the Washington Principles. It was a signatory. I wasn't around then. I can't find much evidence that anyone actually signed these principles as opposed to 
joined consensus on their adoption. Uh, but in fact, they weren't legally binding. They are morally binding in a sense. And they, the other debate is whether they apply to public institutions like museums or to private institutions as well. It's another open question. I say all this, and I'm probably running through my 10 minutes rapidly. I will wrap up just to say that I think these, the effect of the things like the Monuments Men, which is to bring, has brought heightened attention, not just in the US, but in places <coughs> like France, where they just admitted they returned some paintings to the rightful owner get ahead of the premiere of the movie in Paris, which happens about now, to this Gerlich collection, which seems to me very similar in Germany to what would happen in the US. You've got lawyers involved, you've got issues of private ownership, uh, and the legal rights of the private citizen, uh, who has to be given the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. And so we're, we're entering to wrap up uh, sort of a new era, I think, in even the kind of the last 15 years in which we've, the State Department has once again devoted attention to the restitution of Nazi looted property in general and to the return of art in specific. And I don't quite know where we're going. I don't, we talk to the Germans quite a bit. Others have given them a lot more unsolicited advice than we have. And I think we'll try to see as best we can, we try to assist them as best we can in working through this issue so that paintings that were looted will be restored to the proper owners. But I think we have to uh, realize we're entering uncharted territory over the next year in, the, in this kind of discovery. And if experts are to be believed, there may be more Cornelius Gerlitz out there, perhaps even in the United States of America. I'll leave it there. Shakespeare in two seconds. We are, you know, here, we, here comes a sort of quickie matter as to uh, the nature of all of this. So, um, in terms of the size of the theft uh, at the time, this is a map of the Einsatzstabreichstadt of Rosenberg of the ERR, which worked outside the Reich. You can see that it extends into Western Europe. It also extends as far as Crimea, for example. Uh, and, the, and if we look at this uh, in terms of it, this was the greatest theft in history, as I believe you've, uh, you've heard it said. Um, essentially, two-thirds of European jury was killed, but approximately $400 billion in today's prices, by some estimates, was stolen. And this is a little bit as if you took, well, it's an exaggeration, but if you took the entire uh, state of Massachusetts, stole all the property, and then killed all the people, you would have something like this. It wouldn't be a bad way of solving the United States' economic problems, as in any event, the, um, if we're talking about the estimates of cultural property theft, this is various Judaica pieces in Warsaw uh, piled up. Um, the, please note that uh, there were millions of objects that were taken. It doesn't take very much to realize that there have to be millions of objects because uh, ever since the destruction of the uh, temple, uh, in, uh, in the year 70, uh, there has been the existence of multiple places, the focus has been the home and the like, there are ritual objects everywhere, uh, the development of Jewish law meant an explosion of Jewish books, so it's clear even before we get to, quote, paintings and, and sculptures and, and masterpieces in that sense, uh, that we're talking in millions. We do not have decent, uh, we do not have decent estimates of how many artworks as such were taken. Uh, one of the estimates that's sometimes given is about 600,000, uh, of which some 200,000 uh, may still be missing. However, uh, however, it's not quite clear that this is the, uh, 
you know, this is accurate in any way. There were declarations during the war in 1943 in the London Declaration that uh, items should indeed be restituted and that what the Nazis had and their allies had done was null and void. Uh, this was uh, passed by, there were restitution laws passed in various countries, including by the allies of Germany, Italy, Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, as well as by neutral countries. But only about 15% of Jewish assets were returned after the war, mostly in Western Europe. Um, let's take a look at what different countries did. Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, Igor Grabar, the gentleman whose portrait you see here is self-portrait, done in 1947 after the war, um, he devised uh, advice to Stalin that because of the tremendous destruction of artworks and architecture in the Soviet Union, that essentially there should be a massive taking of art in return, and they started to uh, put, a, put up lists of this, mostly of Italian art, because at the time Italy in, uh, was uh, indeed involved. By the end of the war, of course, Italy was not, and the policies therefore had to change. Um, the extent to which this was done, this is this a photograph of the Soviet Jewish poet Evgeny Dolmatovsky in Berlin. Uh, this is, of course, not an organized trophy brigade, an organized uh, Soviet uh, plundering, but this is instead, this is instead uh, an individual soldier. Um, by the way, Evgeny Dolmatovsky was the lyricist for many of Shostakovich's songs. Uh, this, is, this shows you something about, perhaps, the attitude so far as the Soviet Union was concerned. But the Soviet trophy brigades took so much, and so little has been returned, some things have been returned, uh, that in effect this becomes a major matter to this day. This is Chancellor Merkel and President Putin looking at a Bronze Age exhibition uh, which, has, uh, which is in uh, Russia and has not been returned. Um, in the Western uh, sections, the matter was different. There was a lot of art in Judaic in the American zone, and there was discussion by the United States that perhaps, too, the United States should take artworks in compensation and the like, and there were artworks brought to the United States. However, instead of that, the artworks were centralized in the Munich Collecting Point, and there was a general policy, here come the monuments men, there was a general policy of repatriation of art from the Collecting Point in Munich after World War II. Notice that it says repatriation, not restitution. In other words, the policy was to give these items back to the countries from where they came, or where the Americans thought they came, uh, and to let those countries then restitute these to the individuals and organizations involved. However, many of these countries never did that, or they did it only impartially. And that's part of the problem. There are these large collections, including in Germany public collections including in France, the Netherlands, and elsewhere, that essentially were never actually uh, returned. The, the, the Jewish matters were a somewhat different issue. The Jews, for the first time in history, said, we're not going to do what we've done for thousands of years. We're not simply go, going to migrate to the next country or the next city. Instead, we want to take a stand here and to ask for restitution back. As a result, the repatriation policy in the West was not acceptable so far as Jews were concerned. What was going to happen? You were going to repatriate Judaica to Germany? You were going to, to the government of Germany? You were going to repatriate Judaica to governments, other governments that had been the cause of uh, this oppression? As a result, there was agreement made with, in, with the American military authorities, but also with the British and French military author authorities, and essentially, Instead, the idea was that these items should indeed be given back to the Jewish people for distribution. This is the uh, Offenbach Archival Depot where, the, uh, where much of the Juda Judaica was kept. As a result, there was in the American zone created the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization, or JRSO, in the British zone, the Jewish Trust Corporation, and in the French zone, there was a branch, it was a French branch of it. The founding organizations were heavily American because, indeed, this was heavily under American military control, but they were not, by any matter of means, only American. Um, this is essentially, the, that was the entire group. The group included 
Jewish cultural reconstruction, which had begun as a scholarly initiative, and it involved a whole series of well-known uh, scholars and Hannah Arendt and, and, uh, and others who were involved with this to deal with these matters. Eventually, we can talk about that more, but I, I, want to point, I wanted to point that out to you because it's the basis of some other issues. Gerlitt is not the only issue. We'll come back to that later. Eventually, Chancellor Adenauer said that the government of Germany was willing to pay restitution, pay reparations and to handle restitution. This is the formation of the Claims Conference in 1952. It was actually formed in 51, but that's a meeting with Adenauer in 52. Uh, the Claims Conference has all these member organizations from around the world. The ones that are asterisks have been added later to represent directly the Jews who were under uh, communism. Uh, but at the time, the, the Jews who were under communism could only be indirectly represented through the World Jewish Congress, the European Jewish Congress, and the like. Um, this is the closest one comes, in some respects, to an actual representation of Jews around the world. And it's really quite remarkable. And this still remains. This is how our board of directors is still formed. This is where I work. This is now over 60 years later. The, uh, now, in the 1990s, there was the problem that there was so much going on, and with the end of communism, it was an issue of how to deal with the former communist countries of Eastern Europe, that there was another organization formed, another umbrella organization, called the World Jewish Restitution Organization, or WJRO, which consists of these, uh, these organizations. Some of the principal ones in this are the Claims Conference and then also the Joint Distribution Committee. Um, in the 1990s, as Ambassador Davidson was pointing out, there started to be a series of things happening. One of them was that scholars began to write books that were pointing out what had been happening with the art. So on the one hand, you had The Rape of Europa, which is a film of which will be shown here uh, later this week. The Lost Museum by Feliciano pointed out that there were essentially all these artworks that were in public hands, but were, had not been dealt with. And Akincha's book in regard to uh, what had happened in the Soviet Union was also a major revelation. Now, let me point out the following. In the early 1990s, the Claims Conference reached agreement with the government of Germany that property in the former East Germany that was airless, that for which there were no claimants, would come to the Claims Conference as successor organization and be dealt with. The Claims Conference, therefore, has for the last decades been receiving primarily real estate from the former GDR, and we have been selling it and using the proceeds for the benefit of Holocaust survivors and to some extent for Holocaust education, documentation, and research. When it comes to artworks, please understand that there already exists in Germany a way of handling this. Namely, the Claims Conference receives or received what items were deemed to be airless during these past years we have a policy of not selling them. There have been two instances where there are, their sales have been made, quote, sales, where these airless works which have remained in the museums, the museums wanted to essentially make them clearly their own property and there were agreements reached whereby money changed hands. In one of them, there was, it was a problem because an heir then subsequently showed up. But that's, you know, that's an air showing up in, in the 2000s, you know, year, years later. And indeed, in that case, we are working out the question of, you know, presumably all the proceeds that went from that will go to that air. This problem became particularly acute in 1996 in regard to Austria and the Austrian collection that was, uh, was held, which was in a Mauerbach, <coughs> in Mauerbach uh, castle and basically, Basically, that um, collection was put on auction in Austria, and the proceeds went to help uh, survivors and the like. The only problem was that after the auction took place, it became clear that the Austrian government had simply not opened its archives. That when the Austrians opened their archives, it was clear that the actual claimants were known. 
Let's say the people from whom these things were taken were known. This was part of the reason why the Claims Conference then essentially called a halt to selling anything that was in artworks uh, and, and the like. In other words, this was not a reasonable thing because indeed claimants may show up at any time. And one of the things that's an issue generally in legislation is to ensure that there is no deadline for claims so far as movable cultural property is concerned. Now, in the 1990s, as Ambassador Davidson was pointing out, the big issue was the Swiss banks, which led to a whole series of uh, things in, in regard to the scandals. I won't go into that in the 10 minutes given, but there were then these conferences that, that Ambassador Davidson was also mentioning. And I want to point out one thing which is very important about the Vilnius Forum. It's that at the Vilnius Forum, the representative of the government of Israel proceeded to say that all airless artworks and other cultural property should go to Israel. The French and the Americans blocked, and there was a fight until three in the morning, and eventually what came out of it was the notion, not that these things should go to Israel, but there was a recognition, a formal recognition by the, I think it was 37 countries in this case, that attended that such airless property is ultimately the property of the Jewish people. So it's again, it's a continuation from this that it's not, it does not belong to the, uh, the governments where, uh, where it's at. Now, at the current time, you have Cornelius Gerlitt, and this is causing a lot of interest, and yes, we should discuss in the discussion period, I imagine we will discuss these issues in regard to private matters, uh, private collections versus public collections. But let me just say that this is having ramifications throughout the world. It's not just in Germany. It's also here in the United States. It's also in France. There's an indication even for Sweden. There are a number of other uh, places where this is happening. I've recently returned from Serbia. This is, a, you know, this is essentially a, a major matter. And there are a series of achievements and problems in the United States that we perhaps should discuss at a later point. But I want to, in closing, point out that the question of to whom things belong is not just a matter of the fancy, high-end, million-dollar artworks. It's also a major issue so far as Judaica is concerned. And in particular, in regard to communal Judaica, the issues are actually, in some respects, even more complex. The, on the left there uh, is a Torah mantle that comes from the 18th century, comes from the community of Leiden in, uh, in the Netherlands. The monument's men, on occasion, made mistakes. And in this case, this is one of the mistakes made by the monument's men and then also by the Jewish Restitution Success Organization. This should have been returned to the Netherlands, but it wasn't. It was sent to Israel. It's currently in the Israel Museum. The director of the Israel Museum says, well, we've been returning paintings and artworks, but this is Jewish ritual objects. This is Jewish communal property. This should stay in Israel. The item here is part of a, an illustrated Hefer Kedisha book, a burial society book, the 18th century um, from Moravia. Uh, the rabbi of the town, uh, thinking that it would be stolen and so forth, gave it to his sister for safekeeping, not realizing that if he had not done that, it would have been taken to Prague and would be in the Jewish Museum in Prague at this time. In this case, the sister with her family in 1968 emigrated to the United States and a couple of years ago, the grandson put this on auction at Sotheby's for $600,000. The Federation of Jewish Communities of the Czech Republic, which had the legal right, said, wait a minute, this belongs to us. This is still in dispute. Um, this one is particularly interesting. The Tübingen Torah disc. This is a small little silver disc that's at the base of the Torah, base of the Torah uh, holders. Uh, and it's actually very small. It looks very big here, but it's actually very small. And it has on it the information concerning the people who donated the uh, Torah to the synagogue of, uh, of Sgiers uh, near uh, Lodz, Poland. And in this particular instance, the entire public, virtually the entire population of Jews of, of Skiers were killed, the synagogue was burned, the only thing that remains is this tiny little Torah plate. 
it somehow managed to get to the museum of the city of Tübingen in Germany. To whom does it belong? There are heirs to the people who donated it in the 1920s who live in Israel. There, it, there are the possibilities, there are legal possibilities within Poland. The, there is an issue here because this is not private property, this was donated property. It, technically, it's communal. It belongs to the community of Skiers. But the community doesn't exist. What do you do with it? I think, no, I, I, actually, <laughs> with apologies for not making it through in the 10 minutes, let me say that I look forward to the discussion as to what to expect during the next year, but I just want to tell you that this is a much broader matter than Mr. Gerlet and his drawings. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. I deviate a little bit from the script, so I apologize some more. Um, but I'll try to come back to it as soon as I can. I uh, decided to take the uh, title of uh, tonight's uh, uh, lecture panel um, as my starting point. And so, bear with me, I'm going to dissect it. By the way, whatever I say is merely my opinions alone. I don't pretend to hold universal truths, so uh, anybody brought tomatoes and eggs, you can throw them at me. Masterpieces. Well, this is really one of the biggest misnomers about the Holocaust and also about plunder. It's not just about masterpieces, and regardless of what the monuments men and their advocates would like you to believe, most of the items that were stolen were not masterpieces. And I would venture to say that your masterpiece may not be my masterpiece, because after all, there are really some crappy tipolos out there, and there's some extraordinary newsbound paintings, as well as soutines. So, who's to say what a masterpiece is? I'll leave it at that. But I never really espouse the Western canon of art history. I just think that one should look at all art and be the judge of it afterwards. There is no real serious hierarchy except when you really want to establish one, but uh, this is not an argument about our history. In any event, I just wanted to clear that up. Um, as far as numbers, I will not pick bones with Wesley. I would prefer not to play the numbers game, just be content with the fact that it's in the millions. And the thefts took place in approximately 15, 16, 17 countries, so just let your imagination run rampant. The types of objects run the gamut. They include uh, netsukis, they include combs, um, musical instruments, rare books. So it's cultural objects, not just artistic objects. Anything that really fulfills an aesthetic function that goes way beyond its functional utilitarian um, aspect. Now let's talk about airs. Um, well, it's, to me, it's very simple. Theft does not convey title. I'm not a lawyer, but I did learn that sentence. And it simply means, if it's stolen, you should give it back to the person from whom you stole it. That's pretty simple. It doesn't matter that a brigadier general from the U.S. Army could actually pronounce that sentence, because most people in the post-war would probably object to it. So, before we get into moral justice, you should understand that being an heir, or the rightful heir to an object, doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually going to get it back. So there are different kinds of heirs, there are individuals, but there are also entities or organizations, including museums, but they can also be companies. There are all sorts of aspects to what the air looks like, and of course, as Wesley pointed out, there are communities. Uh, there again, it gets very complicated, especially when uh, cultural institutions in the Jewish community decide that they are also the custodians of these pieces, and why should they ever return anything? But we're not going to argue about this tonight because it's an endless argument. And it does affect the issue of airless assets, but it also affects the so-called identifiable assets. So once again, heirs are multifold, but they are anchored in the question of whose property is it. And no matter how much you want to stay away from the legal debate, ultimately, when you look at the history of ownership of an object, you have to think about who is the designated owner of the object. It doesn't mean that the people in this, what we refer to as provenance, are the real or historic or actual owners, but they are the ones who are what we refer to sometimes as current possessors. 
that is what opens the can of worms and everybody goes into the trenches and starts shooting at each other. Fortunately, it's not as litigious as it used to be, but nevertheless, the atmosphere is still rather toxic when it comes to these kinds of questions. So, now that I gave you a little bit of a, you know, short version, uh, let's talk about moral justice. Uh, this is the one where I've kind of uh, stalled. It's an extraordinary concept, but it's actually an ideal. How do you talk about moral justice in a post-genocidal environment? After all, you're talking about moral justice as opposed to legal justice. You know, we frame laws so to suit different interests, presuming that we represent everybody's you know, rights, but as you know, you've read enough books and articles and you know enough people who've quote unquote been victims of miscarriages of justice. The laws are what they are and as you know, the laws are made to be broken. So, moral justice versus legal justice. What would be moral justice for a victim of the Holocaust or a victim of a theft that is inscribed within the context of a genocidal undertaking because that person just happened to be Jewish, happened to have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it is not who that person was, it is what that person was that, did, that produced the miscarriage, the mishandling, the misappropriation, whatever term you would like to use, essentially the removal of the object without that person's consent. That is when the chain of ownership gets broken, and the, end, the idea is to try to fix it. Well, it's one way to fix it, and that's a good thing, but how to fix it in a world which doesn't recognize the idea of fixing it outside the legal s strictures of each and every nation where the crime took place, where the person lived, but also where the item ended up. Because items do migrate. And that is why there's so many instances of claims in countries like the United States and elsewhere, because the art market is global, people tend to move around and they take their belongings with them, and there's also something called the art market where items go up for sale on a regular basis, and the sums, as you well know, are staggering, since we're talking about perhaps a, today a $100 billion market, uh, including private sales, etc. So, moral justice, how would you even do this? The only way that you can achieve moral justice, as far as I'm concerned, is if you have a generalized, a generally accepted principle within which that justice can be implemented. But what principle is that? If we talk about restitution as a generally accepted principle, that's great. But unfortunately, there is no consensus about restitution. We hear things like fair and just solutions. Well, this is where I put on my litigious cap and I say, well, who made up this idea of fair and just solution? It's certainly not the victim because the victim wants the, the property back. It's the people who are referred to as the current possessors. Whether that's right or wrong is up for you to judge. But the point is that we have different formulas today that, to me, set up hierarchies of justice, but as far as I'm concerned, and this is where my bias comes in, my only form of justice is the actual physical restitution of the object in the hands of the rightful owners. Now, I was asked to come up with a case study. There is one that is absolutely perfect, but unfortunately I'm bound and gagged by a lawyer, so therefore I can't discuss it with you. But there are previous cases that in fact uh, merit a very, very brief look. For instance, the ubiquitous Wally. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the documentary. I won't go through all of it, but basically it's a painting that was painted by Egon Schiele, fell into the wrong hands as a result of the Anschluss, and found itself eventually in the collection of a rabid anti-Semite named Mr. Leopold, who then basically decided to create an entire collection of Schiele's because he thought he was Schiele. Reincarnated, Mr. Lauder loved Schiele, so therefore, while he was at the head of MoMA as a chair, he basically encouraged the collection of samples of the collection to come to MoMA. The painting was recognized by some of the heirs, and basically history unfolded itself. Fast forward, past the seizure of the painting, moral justice in the Wally case. Many people really do believe that it actually did happen. I tend to not believe it. In fact, I was sick to my stomach for three weeks. The painting was not restituted. It was basically settled. 
so there was moral injustice. That's my take. Let's go to the Gross v. MoMA case. The errors of George Gross, a wonderful caricaturist, I mean, I like what he does, but he was really a symbol of anything that was, you know, anti-fascist and anti-Nazi during the 20s and 30s, had to get out of town rather quickly, because on the day that Hitler came to power, one of the first things that was done by his brown shirts was basically the ransacking of his studio. Gross understood that it had been in Berlin, that would have been his last day on this planet. Fast forward. He had all sorts of paintings in different collections. Three of the paintings end up at the Museum of Modern Art. 1953 or 1950, Gross recognizes the paintings at MoMA, but doesn't do too much. I mean, he inquires about them. Decades later, a lawsuit is filed seeking restitution. Now, there was a moral injustice in this case, although both sides really messed up, but that's a separate discussion. This is one lawyers really don't know what they're doing. Uh, I'm sorry, I hopefully they're not in the room, but it doesn't matter because it's done, it's closed, it's over and done with. The injustice is as follows. The research was shoddy, and had people done their research, they would have realized that Alfred Barr, the then director of the Museum of Modern Art, knew very well what he was buying, sought advice in council. Even his staff members thought that this was ridiculous, that he should not get these paintings because they were tainted. He still proceeds and buys them. Had that evidence come to court, it would have been a rather slam dunk. The only thing that would have been still contested is why didn't Gross say anything. This is where a legal strategy becomes rather toxic because you don't know really what you're doing. You have to stick to the historical issue. So I just wanted to bring these two items to you as to me examples of more injustice. Thank you. century Dutch panel painting by Eglon van der Meer of a couple in an interior. They're surrounded by signs of affluence, such as a marble floor and columns, walls embossed with gilded leather, a Turkish carpet draped over the table, and a large, rather suggestive painting over the mantel. Eglon van der Meer signed the painting in the lower right. Because of its distinctive details and its secure attribution, the painting's provenance, its ownership history, can be traced as far back as 1802 when it appeared on the Paris art market. Dutch genre paintings of the 17th century have long been the focus of collecting interest in Europe and as such are relatively well documented. The Eglon Wagner is described in five different French sale catalogs between 1802 and 1845 before being sold in Belgium in 1861. Some of this 19th century provenance was provided to the MFA when the museum purchased the work in 1941 from Silberman Galleries of New York. But exactly when and how Silberman acquired it is still not certain. Dealer Abraham Silberman, when pressed for information at the time, <clears throat> would only reveal that the painting had been, quote, brought to this country by a refugee some time ago. The MFA soon learned that the portrait had recently been owned by the art dealer Robert Lavelle of Paris. Having fled to the United States during World War II, Lavelle visited the MFA on October 8, 1943, and he told curator W.G. Constable that around 1937, he sold this picture to Walter Westfeld, then of Dusseldorf. Westfeld was arrested by the German government in 1938, sent to a concentration camp, and his property seized. This was sold by the German government through Lempert's auctioneer of Cologne some time before the fall of France. Whether the picture had previously been sold by Westfeld or was in the sale, Lebel does not know. Well, <clears throat> for years, this note was all we had about the painting's 20th century provenance. And when I began at the MFA in 2003, the Eglon Vandermeer had already been prioritized for further research but nothing about its history had been clarified since October of 1943. 
And I researched the history of the painting off and on for seven years. The questions that I hoped most to answer, such as what happened to the painting after it was sold to Westfeld? How did it reach US soil? And when and how did Silberman Galleries acquire it? I was never able to answer. However, I was able to reconstruct certain data points that existed around the path the painting took. Answering questions instead like, what happened to Walter Westfeld during the Nazi era? What are the ways in which this painting could have left his possession? And what is the likelihood that he both sold it willingly in the 1930s and received proceeds for it? These were the issues the MFA considered in determining whether we had good legal title to the painting or whether it had been sold under duress. Uh, I did extend the provenance for the painting by a few years and clarified some details. I learned that Walter Westfeld was an art dealer who operated a gallery in Wuppertal, Germany, not far from Dusseldorf. He was forced to shut the gallery down in the mid-1930s because he was Jewish. Robert Lebel, another dealer, was Westfeld's colleague, and his statement that he had owned the MFA painting is corroborated by the description, which you see here, of the panel in the catalog of an exhibition held at Lebel's Paris Gallery in 1934. Lebel must have sold the painting to Westfeld after this Paris show and before an exhibition announcement ran in the May 17, 1936 issue of Weltkunst, a German art periodic. And in this brief notice about the Dusseldorf art market, it's written that the gallery August Kloiker was exhibiting paintings of the 17th and 18th centuries, and among the genre paintings is a company seen by Evelyn <coughs> Vandermeer. This exhibition at the gallery Kloiker was otherwise made up of paintings that belonged to Walter Westfeld, so it seems very likely that this painting is identical to the one that's now at the MFA. Here, however, the paper trail for the painting ends. It was in May of 1936 that Westfeld was forced to close his own gallery because he was Jewish. And so as of May 1936, he was prohibited from making a living as an art dealer. To shut his business down completely, Westfeld was required to liquidate his company's assets, namely the gallery stock. And the liquidation took place between October and December of 1936. No records survive of the liquidation of Westfeld's gallery. The liquidation was held at the gallery August Kloiker in Dusseldorf. That's the same gallery that had hosted the May 1936 exhibition that we just saw. But Westfeld did not sell off the entirety of his art holdings in this liquidation. He drew a distinction between gallery stock and his personal property, which he retained, but there's no comprehensive list that survives of his personal property either. Uh, we may ask why Westfeld should have been exhibiting his paintings at the Kloiker Gallery in May of 1936. That is, the very month when his own gallery closed, but still several months before the liquidation. Charges that were later brought against Westfeld allege, and it seems correctly, that the gallery Kloiker opened in Dusseldorf in the spring of 1936 with the collaboration of Westfeld. The gallery was secretly run by Kloiker and Westfeld together, and in fact, it served as a means for Westfeld to continue to sell works of art after his own gallery inevitably closed. So when it was clear he would no longer be able to earn a living running his own business, Westfeld was already selling his paintings at the Kloiker Gallery and continued to do so after the liquidation ended. But the gallery Kloiker was not the only means for Westfeld to sell his works of art after May of 1936. He also sold paintings independently in Germany, but he did not keep records of these sales or report them to the government. Uh, he also held artwork in a bank vault in Amsterdam, which was seized after the German invasion of the Netherlands. And in 1938, Westfeld and Robert Lebel in Paris selected and shipped hundreds of works of art to France for eventual sale. This was the activity for which Westfeld was ultimately arrested, but even in the court charges against him, there's no comprehensive list of the paintings that he smuggled to France, and the fate of these works of art uh, is unknown. On November 15, 1938, Walter Westfeld was arrested for foreign exchange violations and spent the rest of his life in captivity. The works of art that he still had in his possession were seized by Nazi authorities. 
The MFA's painting was not among the works of art that were confiscated from Westfeld, which were later sold at Lempert's Cologne in 1939 in a forced sale of non-Aryan property. After Westfeld's arrest, he was held in police custody until his trial in 1940. He was convicted, charged a monetary fine, and sent to a German penitentiary. On September 29, 1942, he was sentenced to a concentration camp and was deported to Theresienstadt a month later. Then, on January 23, 1943, Walter Westfeld was sent to his death at Auschwitz. Between May of 1936 and November of 1938, there are several ways in which a painting belonging to Westfeld might have left his possession. It could have been sold to or through Kloiker in Dusseldorf. It might have been sold by Westfeld to another individual in Germany. It could have been taken to Amsterdam, where it was later stolen. Or it could have been smuggled into France. We don't know. We do not know what happened to the Eglon Bandinger painting. However, it is clear that Westfeld somehow disposed of the painting after his own gallery closed, at a time when he was living outside the law, participating in activities for which he would lose his freedom and eventually his life. Even if he did receive money for the painting, it would be difficult to state under these circumstances that he had any real control over the proceeds. So while there are still many unanswered questions about the provenance of the painting, the facts that do exist led the museum to conclude that racial persecution was nearly inextricable from the painting's disposal. And with the claimant that is the Westfeld estate and heirs, in 2011, we agreed that a financial settlement would be the most appropriate solution, essentially buying it from them a second time. The painting today remains at the MFA with a label discussing its history whenever it is on view. So while provenance research can often uncover new information about a work of art, in this case, our research yielded a lack of information about the painting itself. What we know about its provenance is actually not very interesting. The Eglon Vanderneer has a history of being a commodity, an object for sale and trade, at least in France in the 19th century, Dusseldorf in 1936, and New York in 1941. Nevertheless, we learned a great deal about the life and career of Walter Westfeld, and it was his story, not that of the painting, that emerged. And it's the more important story, which imbues the portrait with a significance that goes beyond status symbol or market commodity. The painting becomes a means of commemoration. Today, Walter Westfeld's memory may be kept alive through the works of art that he bought and sold, including the Eglon Vendernier portrait at the MFA. Thank you. Thank you uh, all very much. That was very stimulating. I'm not sure where to go with this. I think um, where it leads me is to maybe take a step back from even of the question of who is heir to plundered art to the question of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, what is the point of this endeavor? Um, it seems to me from what uh, Mark said that the idea is to do, even if it may not be moral justice, some sort of justice to the people who actually own the art and had it taken from them and stolen from them. But I guess my question, especially given what Tori has said, is how if we take that more legalistic approach, right? So these are heirs who had property rights who own this, how do we avoid the dilemma of the question of whether something was sold under duress, as Tory expressed it, or was not sold under duress? I mean, was there anything owned by Jews in the 1930s that in some sense wasn't sold under duress? So how do we get out from under the conundrum you described if we take a legalistic approach? And so maybe we'll start with Mark and see what other people have to say about that. Uh, I just have a simple answer to that. Uh, the generally accepted principle is that as of uh, January 30th, 1933, we are in a permanent state of duress until May 10th, 1945, for the simple reason that Jews are losing uh, their rights at an alarming speed. 
And the first four sales, in fact, take place in the uh, end of spring 1933. So uh, we have a permanent climate of duress. And although that is not accepted by many folks uh, who are what I would call current possessors, but also even uh, civil servants in different countries, uh, nevertheless, history in that case doesn't lie. And, and Tori, what would you say about that? Um, I would say it's from uh, the perspective of a researcher working backwards, it's an extremely, these are the most complicated types of questions we have to ask and address. And uh, we may never really know the answer to these questions, but we can try, as we did with the um, Edmond Bedner portrait, to look at the circumstances that the people were under. Would they have sold this? Anyway, had the Nazis not been empowered. Did they Although it sounds like Mark's position is if you owned it before 1933, you were Jewish, then you were the rightful possessor. So is that not the position of? I don't know that I would say that that is uh, looking backwards, you know, holding these works of art in every single instance, that we have to look at the circumstances of each individual transaction, of each individual provenance, of each work of art, and um, look at the facts look at uh, what the historical record shows and go from there. Can you give us an example of a piece of artwork that you thought was not sold under duress? At the MFA? Um, no, well, you could point, if you want, you can point to somebody else's. I mean, that's perfectly fine. Um, I think that, you know, I, certainly there were people, I'm sure, who uh, were able to get their assets out to Switzerland and, and sell them there, for example. I'm not sure what we consider that to be the same as that changed hands in the third right. Okay, and, uh, sure. Uh, uh, I didn't mean to make a really ridiculously sweeping generalization, but the reason why I argued in this fashion is so that you have a starting point. In other words, your starting point should not be, well, everything was just fine in Nazi Germany. Your starting point should be, there is a climate of persecution and there's a climate of exclusion. There's a climate of eviction, there's a climate of firing people. There's basically a pall that is settling in very rapidly over very specific groups, including Jews, and also political persecutees. To answer your question, yes, there are a number of transactions that I would consider to be perfectly kashrut or fine, especially when people are giving paintings to others, objects to others, putting objects in on deposit, but with an idea that, with an understanding that, you know, should I never return, then we're perfectly fine with you keeping them. But again, you need written evidence, you need correspondence, you need, and this is what Tori is referring to, you have got to do your research. But what I simply want to insist on is do not walk away from here thinking that there was a time in Nazi Germany where things were just hunky-dory for Jews. It just does not exist as a notion. I was wondering what um, Leslie might think about this, because it, it seems as if the, you know, the claims conference is not just talking about individual claimants, but about the Jewish people more generally, although interestingly there seems to be some tension between your notion of the Jewish people and perhaps Israel's notion of the Jewish people. So I was wondering who you see, you know, how you navigate that and who you see as having a, a particular claim. I think I'd like to address your first question, which is, okay. what are we trying to do? What are we, right. what is the point? Um, the Holocaust is the most documented genocide in history. If we can solve this, we may have a chance to solve other genocides. Property theft is generally a part of such genocides. It just has not been examined that way because the killing is so obviously horrendous. So if we are looking at the questions of, well, Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, whatever the case may be, um, it would be reasonable to look at the question, what happened to property in those cases? So far, so far as I know, there has been very little research on that question. Uh, but in the case of the Holocaust, it is considerably more possible. And the other thing, which I think that uh, Tori Reid brought up in her uh, discussion, or alluded to in effect, was that as the survivors are passing, the objects become more important. 
And these are matters that have to do with commemoration and with a, a whole set of issues that are not necessarily connected to the legal questions of who is the owner. I think the specific que answer to your question is just simply that, as Mark is pointing out, in these instances, the burden of proof needs to be on the possessor that it was not something discriminatory that was done, that it was not a forced sale and the like. And that is, that, that is an issue, and that can be found in the legal uh, codes of a number of countries. Uh, but otherwise, in terms of what we're trying to do ultimately, we're trying to save ourselves. And save ourselves in what sense? I'm not sure. Uh, look, I made a comparison to the population of the state of Massachusetts being massacred. Um, I know that that's outrageous, I know that, but uh, it's perhaps not so far afield. Uh, this is part of, it's not the only part of, but it's part of a general problem that human beings as a species kill each other. And I, you know, if, if in the process, they also steal things from each other. You want to correct that in order to go into the future. Uh, I, I guess another uh, question I have, and, and this would be for all of the panelists. Um, um, my journalism colleague, Walter Robinson, who I'm delighted to, to say is here, in the late 90s did a series of articles for the Boston Globe, uh, Globe on this issue. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that you know, I I wanted to ask was, you know, we've been talking about this for 15 years. Um, what do you think has gotten better in that time period, and where do the problems still remain? Oh, worse is fine too. I mean, if if you think things are, I mean, look in if, the United States. The United States was a major leader in this field. Uh, in the 1990s and going into the early 2000s. Somewhere around 2006, some of the major museums decided uh, in between their board members and their attorneys that it was good to simply bring cases to quiet title. A claimant would come into the museum, ask for, a, ask for information and to discuss uh, what you know, a particular uh, art object, according to the guidelines put down by the American Association of Museums, now the American Alliance of Museums, uh, they, this was supposed to be handled in a certain way, but instead these larger museums started to slap cases against these people and to essentially force them into court immediately, thereby, thereby forcing them to spend enormous amounts of money and the like. In the process, many people became discouraged. And as a result, in the United States, you started to have a tremendous failure of the legal system. And we can go into the details of that failure if you want, but let me say that at the moment, the countries that are doing the best in this regard are countries such as, believe it or not, Austria, which after it turned around, and you know, after the Waldheim matters and so forth, actually made the Washington Conference principles a part of their law. Germany has acted as if it's part of the law, but it's not. It is voluntary. And this is a problem. It's one of the things that is right this minute being discussed uh, with the Germans as you know, some of the things that they might in fact do. But there are other countries such as the Netherlands that have done a pretty good job and a variety of other, uh, other countries. Some countries have done almost nothing and some of the countries are, it's pretty reprehensible. So I, I guess I wanted to ask Douglas now then, um, especially given what Wesley just said about the United States being among the worst, why you, okay, was, hey, gotten worse, okay. Um, why you think that is? Well, or if you don't agree with it, that's fine too. I entirely agree with Wesley, but I don't really go back in this field to 2006. My impression is that in, in many things, there was initial burst of lots of litigation. There was a big case about 1999 to 2000 called Alton versus Republic of Austria, which resulted in the return of four paintings to the United States, one of which was bought by Wesley's friend Robert Lauder for what I believe was the largest sale of the day that was, you can see it in the Neue Gallery, it's a portrait of the Delaware. 
And there were others of other litigation, the one that Mark mentioned against the portrait of Bali, which was seized in about 1927-98 and lasted until Mr. Leopold died in the year 2010 and the settlement was reached all in about the same week. I think my impression is that this art litigation has waned over time as it's become more difficult to win. It's also quite expensive. Most of the paintings, unfortunately, do not remain in the hands of what Mark would call the rightful owners, but end up, end up being sold or settled. Um, what, what's that function of? I'm not sure, but I think that's the case. In Europe, following, and this is a thing that is deeply painful on other Mark, so I, I venture into this area of my peril, I must say. Following the Washington Conference principles on Nazi confiscated art, Several of the countries that Wesley mentioned set up art commissions to deal, uh, to implement the eleventh and last principle, which called in really difficult English for countries to use alternate dispute resolution mechanisms as alternates to litigation. And that has worked well. That's a lot easier though in a country where all you're doing is asking the Minister of Culture to go to the uh, museums under his or her control. And the Art Commission, which employs provenance researchers like Ms. Reed, decrees that well, this painting doesn't belong here. The Minister of Culture can say, um, give it back. I don't know that Massachusetts has a Minister of Culture, and in any case, I don't think you could, in the same way, force the Boston Museum of Foreign Arts to do this. So the context is much different. And I think that's, even that is imperfect. Quite often, in the case of Germany, people are appointed to. Austria as an example, but they forget the differences between Austria, where I spent three nice years of my life once in Germany, which is almost everything of cultural value in Austria is in Vienna. It's a uh, lovely city with a lot of museums under the control of the Minister of Culture, Sport, and Education. <coughs> Germany is a country more like the U.S., a federal system with diffused centers of power, if you call them that. Financially, Frankfurt probably looks like New York culture, I suppose. It's Berlin, Munich's a power. And so it's, it's, and many of the museums are not under the control of the federal German government. So they suffer from the same problems that we do. So simply to say the Germans, you should do what the Austrians do, is nice in theory, but the Germans, in fact, have the problem that we do in practice with this fusion of museum. Finally, you can look at France, which has 2,000 people. Mark can translate MNR for me, National Recovery Program. 2,000 works of art that it can't identify, or claims to, and it can't find them hanging in museums. But if it could ever identify the owners as beginning to do, it's relatively easy for them to return them um, if they can find an heir to get them to. In the Netherlands, the same way, there are lots of royal collections. That's basically what they're doing. That has gotten better. This doesn't solve the problem of art in private hands, or as I tried to say, or in the hands of the rare private museum that exists in the world. But I think, I also think some of the interest in this issue that was much higher maybe 15 years ago than it is now has also taken some of the momentum. Okay, well, very good. And I'd now I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. And again, we're going to have a mic right over there. So I think the thing to do is just to, for you to go to the mic rather than have the mic come to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I think American museums have made tremendous strides since 2000. Um, before the advent of the internet, museums didn't disclose provenance. It was considered confidential information. And with the museum guidelines sort of dovetailing with the creation of the internet, museums have a means of making their records transparent and available to anyone around the world. I think American museums are among the most transparent uh, anywhere. Um, I think we have increased resources, we've increased our due diligence policies, museums are starting to ask questions before purchasing works of art. You have people and like you on museum staff, sir. Exactly, right. and uh, at the MFA, we have resolved six claims in favor of claimants since 2000, so I would not paint a, a bleak picture myself. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, now, so people could come to the mic, that would be great. Um, a couple of you mentioned the Gurlitt matter as being a major matter. 
I don't know if everybody else, I only know what I read in the general newspaper, so there were a couple of articles and it kind of faded. Could you, uh, you know, I understand it was this enormous cache of art that was it the nephew or great nephew of an art dealer uh, had that was discovered, but what, what is it about it other than uh, the, the number of, of paintings over many of hundreds of what, what is it about it that really makes this a big deal now in this, in this uh, world? First of all, it's not a great nephew, it's, uh, it's the son of Hildebrand Gerlet, who was, uh, well, a uh, very active, very, very busy man, who uh, basically took full advantage of the uh, presence of Hitler in power and, its, uh, and the Nazis' cultural policies. He first traded in uh, so-called degenerate works, in other words, items that were purged from uh, German public collections, but also items that were basically forced <coughs> Uh, to be sold uh, from Jewish collections, but also from collections belonging to critics of the Nazi government. So, once um, uh, that was done in his life, in his in that particular phase of his career, he moved on to occupied territories, particularly France, where he had a wonderful time shopping. Uh, Rue de Seine and some other wonderful parts of Paris. He also did some uh, shopping sprees in uh, in Holland. And there's also evidence that he might have acquired things either in Austria or elsewhere. So clearly a very busy man. We don't even know to date how many items he actually purchased. So this is where, it, this is to the point. Cornelius Gerlitt, as um, Ambassador Davidson pointed out, uh, because of a little problems with the tax authorities, uh, has uh, some entanglements with the Bavarian police and there is a search order for his uh, search warrant to open his apartment and they find all this stuff. Granted, it was extraordinary because nobody in their right mind would think, well what's this really weird guy doing with 1400 works stashed behind the refrigerator and elsewhere? Uh, he's not even really taking care of them very well. So some folks got upset about that, but bottom line, 1406? I mean, wow, that's a lot. Okay, uh, it is a lot, but it's not unusual. I mean, it's just, you know, there are, lots of, there are lots of very large collections. What did strike the imagination is that ridiculous figure of 1.2 billion euros. Uh, it's staggeringly wrong. Uh, if you can get actually 10 million or 20 million out of this collection, you'd be pretty lucky, since 80% of it is works on paper. The reason why it's significant, at least for me. Where did the number come from then? Who knows? Um, no, really, no, really. Um, There are several things about the Gerlitt matter, which is the only, one of the many reasons why it became an international scandal. The first one is it was so mismanaged. I mean, we're talking about ridiculously, outrageously mismanaged by individuals who should have known better. Uh, instead of being transparent, quote unquote, they hid behind government secrecy. They basically employed all sorts of uh, investigative privileges to essentially hide the fact that they knew about this collection for two years. Uh, we also found out very quickly that there was actually at least one Provenance researcher and another art historian who had access to this collection. In fact, one of them came to one of our workshops and we didn't even... She actually alluded to the fact that, oh, I'm working on an interesting collection. We didn't know it was Gerlitt. So, uh, you have this kind of atmosphere of pretense, uh, deceit, concealment, and that's really what made the Gerlitt affair what it is. To me, what's interesting are the questions that are not asked, and yeah, I thought they were very basic questions. The first question is, what was the starting point of the Gerlich collection? In other words, when Cornelius's dad dies in his car accident in 1956, how many works of art did he inherit? To this day, not a single person is capable of answering that question. You know, it's pretty simple. There's a will, and there's a list, and then you count, and then you give a figure. That seemingly is impossible to get to. So, I don't know what the starting point is. 3,000, 2,000, 5,000? This man survived based on the sales of items from his dad's collection. It is a net sale. He does not work a day in his life. So, nobody seems to be worried about that. And I would be worried if I was in the art market because that means that for 35, 40 odd years, he's been polluting the art market with bizarre works of art, with no provenance, except that he knows what the provenance is. So we have lots of questions about it. And the reason why people are so astounded by it is because we don't know how many other collections there are, as Ambassador Davidson pointed out. There are, in my mind, thousands of girlets because that is the true nature of plunder. There are thousands of people like him who had a great time during the Third Reich, 
who were completely rehabilitated, and I'm sorry to say by the Monuments Men. They went back to their jobs, and they were absolutely successful in their post-war careers, which were no different than their wartime careers, which are actually no different than their pre-war careers. We call that, in history, a continuity, from the pre-war to the war to the post-war. That's one of the great failures of the post-war quote-unquote restitution scene. A footnote in regard to this, uh, in terms of the monies and the like, unfortunately, the press generally is interested only in money, which is absurd in this whole matter, because it's really not about money, but it gets blown up this way, and that's what is paid attention to. And that's actually a major problem. Uh, and it's the reason why I specifically brought in Judaica, so, because you, you need to look at this in a more broad sense. Uh, one of the uh, current issues in the discussions between Israel and the Palestinians is the description of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people. If, in fact, I think the President of the United States has accepted that description, I'm not sure about the State Department. But, um, if, if Israel is successful in uh, getting universal acceptance of that, would that affect these issues as to property that has no current claims? Um, first of all, what is wanted by Israel is to be recognized as a Jewish state. It is not, as I understand it, asking to be the only Jewish state or something of this kind. Uh, and indeed, it's very interesting to note all the discussions about how Crimea at one point was being thought of by Stalin as a place for Jews to go before Gerardi John was, uh, was uh, selected for that purpose. Um, the, I, I should note that in regard to Gerlet, one of the effects is on the state of Israel. It's actually a rather interesting matter in that at this point, this has become a major issue in Israel, not so much because of Gerlach, the Gerlach, the Gerlach case has been calling more attention to this, but primarily because Israel is one of the few countries that has a very specific law in regard to property that belonged to victims of the Holocaust. The uh, law that created the company for the location and, uh, and restitution of Holocaust assets in Israel specifically states that property that belonged to people who died during the 1941-45 period uh, is to come to the company and is to then be redistributed. Now, they've mostly been dealing with questions of property, people bought land in Palestine or uh, deposits in, in banks and, and, and so on, the Leumi Bank and so on. However, in more recently, they have come to the realization that they need to start doing work on the cultural property. And indeed, as of the end of June, there is to be a forum in Israel, uh, which is specifically on this issue, and further discussions regarding what should happen in Israel, regarding property that belongs to individuals and families that are held by institutions in Israel. Any more questions? No? Okay, so I just wanted to conclude, first of all, by thanking the panelists. Um, it was a lively and informative discussion, and I very much appreciate all of their presences here. Um, I also wanted to let you know about a couple more programs we're going to be doing. Um, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we have the artist Samuel Bach, um, who is also a survivor of the Vilna Ghetto, and he's going to be talking about his life and his art, and that is going to be a 240 doxer in the law school. And then on uh, Thursday at 5.30, just upstairs here in the Cabral Center, we're going to be showing the film The Rape of Europa. And I think as some of the panelists mentioned, it's a, a much more interesting and thorough discussion than in Monuments Men um, and on the same basic topic. Um, and then in coming weeks, on April 1st, um, we are going to be having seven members of the Knesset at uh, Northeastern University. It'll be at 7.30 in the evening in Blackman Hall. And so we hope you will all be able to attend that as well. And thank you very much for your presence and uh, have a good evening.